This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing the rental of a car. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example. This time only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, sir. Welcome to Cheapy's Car Hire. Can I help you? Yes, please. I need to rent a car. That's no problem, sir. When would you like it? Tomorrow morning. Let's look then. Today is the sixth of August, so you'll need it on the seventh of August. So, seventh of August is the correct answer. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation, and answer questions one to five. Good morning, sir. Welcome to Cheapy's Car Hire. Can I help you? Yes, please. I need to rent a car. That's no problem, sir. When would you like it? Tomorrow morning. Let's look then. Today is the sixth of August, so you'll need it on the seventh of August. That's right. Now I'll just need to take some details from you, sir. Can I take your name, please? John Wilson. And your home address? Ninety-five, Green Lane, Manchester. Green like the colour? Yes, that's right. And the postcode is M W seven four D F. Okay, got that. Can I have your telephone numbers, please? My home number is O two O six eight three four six three eight seven, and my mobile is O treble seven nine seven two four eight six eight. Sorry, I missed the mobile. It's o seven 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 nine seven two four eight six eight. Thanks. Now, are you the holder of a full current driver's license? Yes, I am. Could I take the number of the license, please? Sure. Let's have a look now. It's W I L. Nine four eight five seven eight two six nine. And will there be any other drivers, or just you? Only me, please. Okay. You said that you wanted the car tomorrow, but how long will you want it for? Well, tomorrow's Friday the seventh, and I want it for the whole weekend. So I'll bring it back on Monday morning. I'll have to charge you for all Friday and Monday, sir. That's okay. Good. Now, what kind of car were you looking for, sir? I'd like a fairly small car, as I'll be driving a lot around town, and a smaller car will be easier to get around and to park. Yes, that's true. Well, I've got small sizes in the following types of car: a Ford, a Renault, and a Toyota. They're pretty much the same, though the Toyota is in a cheaper price category. I'll take the cheapest one, please. And we can offer you a petrol or a diesel model with that car. Oh, in that case, I'll take the diesel, as that will be more economical. 
Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Now how much will this cost me? Well, the daily rate is £50, but it's only £40 if you take the car for four days or more. Let's see. There's also an additional £10 for insurance. That's not obligatory, but we do recommend that you take the insurance. Yes, definitely. So that'll be £170 for the four days then. Fine. Where can I pick it up? You can pick it up here, at the airport or at your hotel. Which hotel are you in? I'm staying at a friend's house next to the International Hotel. So can you leave it at the International Hotel and then I can walk around to pick it up? I'll drop it off at the same place if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. By the way, if you have a breakdown or an accident, we'll supply you with a new hire car ASAP. Our emergency number is on this customer information leaflet, which also has other information. Here you are, and here is a spare set of keys for the car. Now, let me tell you about some things in the car that will be there to help you. First of all, your insurance documents will be in the glove compartment along with a Wesley City map and the car manual. On the back seat, there will be a larger area map of the local district. If you need a map of any other place, like London, then give us a call and we'll make sure it's there. No, I won't need that. In the boot, you'll find a spare wheel and a set of tools in case you have a problem. We have membership with the RAC, so you can call them if you're really in trouble. The membership card and phone number is in the glove compartment too. There will be a small fire extinguisher under the passenger seat, but I hope you won't have to use that. Great. So where do I pay? If you go over there to Mr Walker, then he'll sort you out. That is the end of part one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 16. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up ten years ago by myself, John, and my then-girlfriend and now-wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby, We felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. (laughs) While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the National Park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. 
We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full time on Barker's country safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out, and we have all of our ten jeeps and convoy with eight people in each jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So, as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here, so they come back for the bigger tours.、Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8 a.m. and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. and then evening ones 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. All the tours follow the same route, and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the family exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually, it is just one jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours, as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal.、Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to the specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. That is the end of part two. Now turns to part three. You will hear a discussion between students about a university assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Well, as you know, we have to plan and conduct a survey. How should we organise this? Well, I think we should divide up the task and then assign them to people who want to do them. I think that's a good idea. I don't want to talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if we divide up the tasks, no one will feel as though they are doing all the work. Even distribution, it's fair. I've done it this way before, and it's always worked out quite well. Yes, I agree. But what if some tasks are longer than others? Then it doesn't seem fair. Well, then we have to make sure we divide the tasks up according to time estimates. Some tasks may take longer, for example, the interview stage, and others shorter, like perhaps the layout of the survey form. Okay, then, Carol. That sounds like a great idea. 
I seem to recall reading somewhere in our lecture notes that dividing up tasks was highly recommended for group work, so I feel good about what we're doing. OK, then, what are the tasks and who wants to do them? Well, at the moment, I'm studying layout and design, so if nobody has any objections, I'd like to work out the design of the survey. I'll have this finished by mid-March, the 23rd to be exact. I've got other assignments to do around that time. That's fine with me. I hate design and layout. What about organising the questions? Someone's going to have to do this. Could I? I promise to be all finished by mid-March. What do you think, Carol? Yes, that all sounds good. I guess someone's going to have to do the questioning. Why don't I conduct the survey? The assignment is due on April the 3rd, so I will have the survey completed by late March, just in time for the oral report. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Yes, about that oral report, does anyone have any notes from last lecture? There were some good ideas about how to give a good oral report. Yes, I happen to have them right here. There were some very helpful suggestions given by Professor Thompson. Should we take a moment to go through them? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes please. Well, firstly, the report itself is due after the survey has been handed in. I believe our group will be presenting it on the 12th of April. 12th of April? That's the date of my counting exam. Anyway, Professor Thompson said we mustn't speak longer than 20 minutes, or less than 15. He said when it comes to assigning greys, he will be looking for speakers to maintain eye contact with the audience. In other words, don't just stand up and read the presentation. That's been my problem in the past. I spend all my time looking at my notes and the audience gets bored. Yes, that's right. Another point to remember is to make good use of gestures. Standing there like a robot is also very boring for the class. Another thing to consider is visual aids. He said we should include a variety of them, things like overhead transparencies, handouts. We can use the whiteboard. DVDs or video were also suggested. OK, let's decide who wants to do what. That is the end of Part 3. You will now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a woman talking about retail psychology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. Let's get started on the final lecture in our module on retail psychology. Today we're going to focus on supermarket layouts and how retailers display their products to encourage us as customers to spend as much of our money as possible. It's an interesting topic. Now, most of us don't actually realise that the layout is deliberately designed to make us part with our money. But in fact, millions of pounds are spent on research into the psychology of shoppers and what motivates us to buy. So, Let's have a look at an actual supermarket layout. Now, 
Here's the entrance to the store, just here. This area immediately around the entrance is what retailers refer to as the decompression zone or the dead zone. This is where the customers recover from the environment outside, and by that I mean this is where they adjust. For example, the place where they might put their keys in their pockets or take off their sunglasses. These kinds of things. So, what do you notice about this area? It's very empty, isn't it? Yes, it's pretty much clear of stock altogether. This area is not designed or used to sell us anything. Basically, the supermarkets never put any merchandise here because they know that no one's ready to buy yet. However, the retailers want their customers to feel comfortable. If they're in a relaxed state of mind, they're much more likely to stay longer and spend money. Now let's look back at the entrance again. Now it's interesting, but we know that three quarters of us look right, not left, when we go into a supermarket. So seventy-five percent of people. This gives the supermarkets a great opportunity to hit us with promotions and offers. So near the front door, you might also find what we call the dwell zone. The dwell zone. Is the area on the right-hand side by the front door, where you are encouraged to relax and browse. You will usually find newspapers and flowers here to help you do exactly that. Moving on from the dwell zone, we come to the power aisle. Basically, it's the main route customers return to after venturing into nearby aisles. And so this is the area of the supermarket where the strongest offers are displayed. So you might see a sign that reads "Barbecue Time," and you'll see all the items you could possibly need for a barbecue: the charcoal, the sauces, the skewers, and the drinks. Everything you need, all in one place. Were you planning a barbecue before you went shopping? Do you even have a garden? <laughs> yes, the power aisle has a very powerful effect on sales, even though most of us don't even realize we are being sold to here. Now let's think about fruit and vegetables for a moment. They're always located towards the front. Now, why do you think this is? Yes, fruit and vegetables are always at the front because it gives the supermarket a healthy image. And let's think back to flowers and newspapers. We talked about both these items earlier, and yes, they're displayed near the front on the right. Now they're known as distress goods. Why is that? Well. These are the goods that we often buy in a hurry or on impulse. In other words, these are the items we didn't actually intend to buy at all, but the supermarkets want us to put them in our trolleys even before we start our proper shopping. Now, what about everyday items like bread or milk or cereals? They're always placed right at the back of the supermarket. Yes, in this area here. Again, this is a deliberate strategy by the supermarkets. Basically, they want us to walk through the whole store to get them, in the hope we will buy other things on the way. That's why items like these are often called destination goods. Now, where products are placed on the shelves makes a real difference. We read shelves a bit like we read a book. Our eyes go from left to right, and they want you to focus on the more expensive items, so they place them at eye level. It's often quite hard to spot items like cheap tinned food. Why is that? Well, 
they're normally placed very low on the shelves. Basically, the supermarkets don't want the cheapest products to be the ones you see first. Finally, let's have a look at the checkout area here. Now, we all know that sweets are deliberately placed within the reach of children at the checkout. But all kinds of things are displayed at checkouts these days. In fact, supermarkets can change what's on offer almost by the hour. It's a quick and easy way for them to rotate their stock. So, if the sun comes out, the checkout is an ideal place to display sunglasses. And if it rains, umbrellas can be placed there instead. Now, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.